Hello, and welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Karen Snape with Virginia Cooperative Extension, and this week I'm bringing you a few more invasive species. So just like uh, my last invasive species video, this time we are talking about plants that are not native to our ecosystems here in Virginia, that have been introduced by people, whether intentionally or not, have become established in the area, able to grow and reproduce without human help, and which have now become a problem in those areas where they have been established. So we'll look at a few examples and hopefully learn a little something. The first invasive plant we're going to talk about this week is the autumn olive. As you can see, autumn olive is a large shrub growing quite a bit taller than I am and as wide as it is tall a large mounding shrub. And you can tell even from a distance that there is a silver green appearance to the leaves. Autumn olive is native to China and Japan and it was introduced into the US in the 1830s. It has been widely planted for wildlife habitat, for erosion control and hedgerows, and also for mine reclamation. It is very tolerant of poor soil conditions, including high levels of salt and heavy metals and poor pH. And so it's very adaptable in that way. It can grow on marginal sites, on abandoned um, mining and industrial lands, but it also is a, is a big problem in pastures and um, places where uh, it may have been planted intentionally in the past for say the wildlife value, but it has since become a nuisance. So here's an autumn olive twig. You can see that the leaves are alternate, not across from each other on the stem, but one side and then later on the other. And the leaves are rather plain in shape. They're not serrated or toothed. They don't have any lobes. They're just simple entire leaves. But you can kind of see it a little bit on this side, but if you flip it over, you'll see that silver color that we saw on the large bush. Now this may be a little bit hard to see, but if you flip the leaf over, it might not show up well on the video, but the leaf backside is very metallic silver color, sometimes also flecked with gold or coppery metallic flecks, but it's, it's very distinguishable. It's very silver, very metallic looking. And actually even the stems have these flecks on them of metallic silver or gold, and we'll see in a few minutes that even the fruit have these metallic speckles. And that's very distinctive for the autumn olive. Here are some of the fruit of the autumn olive tree. They're a small berry, um, not really like an olive at all, although they look a little bit like it right now because they're still green. Here's a close-up of a ripe berry from an autumn olive. You can see it still has those metallic speckles that we saw on the leaves and the stems, even when it's red and ripe. Um, and these can be used uh, in jams and jellies, as well as being eaten by a number of songbirds. So one of the problems with autumn olive is that it does produce large numbers of these berries, which is why it was planted, um, because these berries were thought to be good food for our wildlife, particularly game birds. But it turns out that they're rather low in nutritional value. So they're not really very good quality food for wildlife and game birds. Autumn olive also can change the nitrogen cycle of a site. And it also provides poor nesting sites for birds, rather like the bush honeysuckle that we learned about a few weeks ago. Autumn olive can be controlled mechanically if you're able to remove the entire root system. Mowing is only effective if it's followed up with an herbicide application. You can apply herbicide to the leaves, either glyphosate, triclopyr, or a combination, or you can apply a triclopyr product to cut stumps or as a basal bark spray. Multiflora rose is native to East Asia. It was first introduced into the United States in the 1860s as an ornamental because of its many beautiful white flowers and also as rootstock for other more delicate ornamental roses. In the 1930s, Multiflora rose was planted widely for erosion control in hedgerows and as wildlife habitat. Here's a Multiflora rose bush. 
They can grow much taller than this, taller than I am. This is a relatively low growing multiflora rose bush, but you can see how sprawling it is, how it continues for, for quite a while. And if you look underneath, you can even see how it has all of these stems and canes coming up from all different spots down below. So just a, a very large sprawling um, shrub that can grow quite tall, but is normally more spreading than it is tall. Here is a much taller example of Multiflora rose. This picture was taken in May and shows the clusters of white flowers that give Multiflora rose its name. Multiflora rose has larger clusters of flowers and more clusters of flowers than most native roses. The flower clusters arise not only at the tips of the branches, but also from the places where the branches branch. The flowers of Multiflora rose are white, whereas the flowers of most of our native roses are pink. The presence of white flowers combined with what we'll see on the leaf stems in a few minutes tell us for sure that this is a Multiflora rose. So the berry-like fruits of a rose bush are called rose hips. You may see rose hips as an ingredient in teas or soaps. And the rose hips of the Multiflora rose are very small. You can see here, um, smaller than most of the other roses that grow in our area. And they are green right now, but they will turn red, but they don't really get any bigger than this. So here's a close-up of the Multiflora rose stem, and you can see how the leaf stem, that petiole, has um, teeth or hairs uh, or whatever you want to call it on it. So I'm going to peel this off. So you can see how, how that leaf stem has these fringes on it. And that's something that is diagnostic for the Multiflora rose. For a stem, to have the stems like that combined with the white flowers is distinctive for the multiflora rose. So that's something to look out for there on the base of the leaf stems. Multiflora rose is a problem because it can spread and take over large areas. It spreads not only from the seeds, which are eaten and dispersed by many species of birds, but also by layering which is when a branch or cane of the rose bush can arch down and touch the ground, and where it touches the ground, it can form a new uh, multiflora rose plant. And so they can spread very rapidly and form very large thickets. Um, these are especially a problem in pastures and also on uh, abandoned land and uh, road mer mergers and things like that. And um, also I've seen a lot of this at old house sites in the woods. In order to control multiflora rose by mechanical means, you're going to have to mow it three to six times per growing season in order to keep it in check. Multiflora rose can also be controlled with either glyphosate or triclopyr products, and that can be done after mowing to the cut stumps or to the fresh regrowth. So oriental bittersweet, as the name implies, was introduced from the Orient, or the East, China, Japan, and Korea. It was introduced in the mid-1800s as an ornamental and has also been used for erosion control, hedgerows, wildlife habitat, just like many of the other invasive species that we've talked about. So here's some of an oriental bittersweet vine. You can see the leaves are um, a little bit variable. Some of them are more oval and others like this in the back are more round. So they do tend to have that pointy tip, um, even when they're more round. So here's another oriental bittersweet vine. And if you look closely, you can see that each place that a leaf comes out, there's also a little bud. And those little buds will persist even if the leaves are eaten like these. And even in the fall, when the leaves fall off, these little buds remain. And they, get, they can get kind of hard and woody. Almost like they're trying to be a thorn, but not quite making the grade. And uh, they can really tear your hands up when you're trying to pull up these vines. 
There is a native American bittersweet vine. The characteristics we've looked at so far are very similar between the Oriental bittersweet and the American bittersweet. The biggest difference comes in the location of the flowers and the location and the appearance of the fruit, which is born in the fall. I'd like to give a shout out to our colleagues at the Delaware Department of Agriculture for this excellent publication called Mistaken Identity. And we'll be sure to put a link in the comment section. But um, here you can see the difference in the fruit between the two species. So the Oriental bittersweet, which is the one that you've probably seen, it's far more common than our American bittersweet, but it has yellow capsules around the reddish berries of the fruit. Whereas in the American, both the capsules and the fruit are more orange. There's not that distinction between the, the yellow capsules and the red fruit in the American. The Oriental bittersweet is also born in the axils of the leaves. So about the position of those buds we were looking at a minute ago. Whereas the American bittersweet fruits are born terminally at the ends of the branches only. I like to say that Oriental bittersweet is kind of the kudzu of the north. Um, just like kudzu, it can spread over um, very large areas, climb over um, trees and houses and barns and blanket an area, pull down the vegetation um, as it climbs and cause a lot of, of trouble. If kudzu is the vine that ate the south, I like to say that oriental bittersweet is the vine that ate the north. It was very common where I grew up in Pennsylvania, um, but we didn't really see it when I lived in the Fredericksburg area. But again, out here um, in the mountains in southwest Virginia, where it's a little bit cooler or whatever, um, here we have the, the oriental bittersweet again. Oriental bittersweet is a threat because it grows very quickly. And because it grows by twining around what it grows on, it can also strangle trees and shrubs and other native plants and, and kill them. Um, the seeds are spread by wildlife. They also float and are spread by water and are also spread by humans because they are very ornamental and um, people like to, to bring those into their homes, make wreaths and hang them on their doors and things like that that actually end up spreading this invasive plant. Oriental bittersweet was recently declared a noxious weed in Virginia. That's a legal designation that makes it illegal to move oriental bittersweet without a permit. So it can no longer be sold or transplanted in Virginia in an effort to keep it from spreading. Oriental bittersweet is another one of those invasive species that's very difficult to control without the use of herbicides. For very small plants, you can try pulling them up. And if you get the entire root system, that can be effective. But oriental bittersweet is very good at sprouting back from the roots and stumps which makes um, pulling and mowing and cutting um, very difficult to, to use successfully. So cutting the vines can help to save any trees or bushes that they're climbing on because it will kill those vines that are on them, um, but then they will sprout back. Uh, for the same reason, prescribed burning is not very effective since it will top kill the vines, but they'll sprout back. So one of the best methods is to cut the vines and then allow them to sprout back and then treat um, those sprouts with a foliar herbicide spray. Um, you can also do a cut stump spray. But again, because they are so prolific in their sprouting, it can be hard to find all of the little sprouts to get with the herbicide. And so allowing it to leaf back out and using a foliar spray is often the best result. You can use a glyphosate or a triclopyr product, although as with most woody vines and woody species, uh, the triclopyr is probably going to be more effective or a combination of triclopyr and glyphosate. And uh, to learn more about using herbicides, we have two other 15 minute in the forest videos. So um, Adam's video from two weeks ago and Jennifer's from three weeks ago will help you to use herbicides safely and effectively. So that's all I have for you today. Make sure you join us next week when Bill Worrell will be telling us all about the American chestnut. The week after that, we're taking off for Labor Day, but we have six more 15 Minute in the Forest videos planned after Labor Day. 
And if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to give us a like and a subscribe so that you find out about our videos as we post them. Thank you and have a good week.